We have an anonymous blobfish, y'all. <laughs> I love an anonymous blobfish sighting. Right. So now we will get started with some introductions. So we have three lovely presenters today. Um, Tessa Minchu is the Electronic Resources Librarian at NC State University's Libraries. Bethany Blankemeyer is the Serials and Electronic Resources Acquisitions Librarian at Duke University Libraries. Yan Song is the Electronic Resources Acquisitions and Licensing Librarian at Duke University Libraries. And we also had two collaborators for this webinar, Beverly Charlotte, who is at North Carolina Central University, and Abby Wicks, who's also at Duke University. And with that, I will hand it over to Tessa, who will start off with sharing why do we need licenses? And of course, I lost my presenter notes. One second. <laughs> so sorry. Okay, here we go. So um, I'm going to start off with a familiar disclaimer. We are not attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> we are librarians who license, which is not nearly as fun as being ladies who lunch, but it does mean that we know enough to negotiate library content licenses and to give this informational webinar, which should not be taken as legal advice, which you should be getting from your Office of General Counsel or other institutional legal authority. Now, one more disclaimer, you probably all know how librarians have three different words for the same things, and licensing is no exception. So during this presentation, you may hear us say license or contract or agreement. They all mean the same thing. Also, we sometimes refer to individual provisions in a license as terms, and sometimes we call them clauses. These words are interchangeable. Uh, but this can get confusing because the word term can also mean the subscription or contract term, i.e. how long you have to access a product or how long the contract governs the product. And contextual cue clues will usually clear this up. So diving right in, uh, libraries need licenses because electronic resources aren't physical materials that we can hold and control. The entity selling the electronic resources has, within reason, the right to dictate terms of use, and we have the moral obligation to protect the interests of our users and institutions, along with the statutory obligation to adhere to state laws if we are a state institution. And there are likely going to be some institutional regulations thrown into this mix, too. So you'll notice I'm only talking about e-resources here. It's not unheard of for an enterprising publisher to try to require a license for physical material like a CD-ROM or even a book. Just do not do it. If for no other reason than preserving the right of first sale that library lending is based on, just tell them Tessa said no. Uh, now, the terms a license codifies can be split into two broad categories, business terms and, confusingly, license terms. These are a little bit of an overlapping Venn diagram, but I've tried to list some examples on the slide that are clearly one or the other. You can think of business terms as the what of the license. What is the content being licensed? What is the purchase model in play? Is it a one-time purchase, a subscription, some kind of evidence-based acquisitions model, something else entirely? And a really biggie, what is it gonna cost us? The license terms are kind of more of the how of the license. How are the authorized users defined? How can they use and not use the content? Can we ILL the content? If so, how? How are breaches handled? If we have perpetual access, how does that work? And so on. Now, this is just a scandalously brief list of some concepts you will find in your average library content license, but you can already see that there's a lot more involved here than there would be if we were just buying, say, a print copy of Chase calendar of events. And you can see why it's really important to have all this written down in a mutually agreeable contract. There are a lot of opportunities for misunderstandings here, and licensing is like the manifestation of good fences making good neighbors. And with that, I'm going to pass you off to Bethany so she can walk you through the holistic practice of licensing. Thank you, Tessa. Just making sure I'm unmuted because sometimes I'm not. Thanks so much, Tessa, for laying the groundwork for our discussion. Uh, getting started on e-resources licensing can be very daunting, um, especially if you are completely new to it, e or even if you have experience, but you're starting at a new institution with different priorities. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Uh, before you start reviewing a license, you should consider the following. Identify your stakeholders at your institution. Consult any existing documentation that you may have. Consider any local mandates. And remember to tap into the library licensing hive mind, as I like to think of it, when needed. In terms of identifying stakeholders at your institution, you should first consider who is already involved in licensing. This could be any acquisitions, collections, or technical services staff that you work closely with. Do you have a collection development librarian who is in charge of collections decisions? Are you one of the lucky few with a designated licensing librarian? Perhaps you're in a small shop with only the university general counsel to turn to. Additionally, you will want to determine who has signatory authority. Is it someone in the library, like the library dean or the head of technical services? Is it someone outside of the library? Some institutions have to route their licenses through the university procurement office. You'll want to have that sorted out before you get started. If you're lucky, you will have some existing documentation to sort through. In a perfect world, your predecessor will have left well-organized files of all previous negotiations, complete with signed license documents going back to the beginning of time. For those of us living in reality, that will not be the case. Some of you will start with paper licenses tucked away in file cabinets or random email printouts confirming perpetual access to something. Take some time to go through whatever documentation was left for you and try to familiarize yourself with how licensing was done before you got there. You will also want to consider any local campus manda mandates that need to be reflected in your licenses. For example, does your campus have an open access publishing mandate? Um, any other mandates to be aware of? If so, you will want to make sure that the language and your licenses align with the goals of such a mandate. And when in doubt, always remember that you have a community of librarians ready to help. There are a number of listservs where interesting and helpful conversations take place around e-resource licensing issues. Um, the one I listed here, LibLicense or LibLicense, whatever you want to call it, is one such listserv. If you need help crafting a sample license to present to vendors, sample licenses can be found online, as well as best practices to follow for developing your own local language. Also, you can always ask the publisher if they will accept a CIRU agreement in place of a full license. CIRU stands for Shared E-Resource Understanding. NISO, the organization, maintains a registry of libraries and publishers willing to use CIRU in place of a full license agreement. And we'll have a link to the CIRU terms at the end of the slide deck for you to look over. Um, but definitely look into using CIRU if you can, because it will save you a lot of time as you won't have to negotiate a full license. Okay. Yes, Tessa, yay, Ciro. <laughs> okay, now that you've sorted out who should be involved in licensing at your institution and what your library or campus requires you to include or not include in your licenses, you are ready to get started. There are many ways you can go about doing the actual work of negotiating a license, but I recommend some variation of the following. In terms of documentation, you'll want a checklist of wants, needs, and absolutely must not haves in for your license languages. Tessa will talk more about this later, but there will be terms that you know are considered nice to have, terms that you absolutely have to have in a license, and this will differ from school to school, public versus private, and terms that you can't have in a license or else your signatory just won't sign it. What complicates this is that every institution is different and have di has different priorities, even amongst the various schools represented here today and amongst the presenters, um, there are big differences in the way that we license and what we consider deal breaker terms or not. Public schools, on one hand, can rely on state law to get past some unsavory terms, but on the other hand, they require licenses to include certain causes that private schools have more flexibility with. Once you have those wants and needs sorted out for your institution, you will have your checklist to help you work through each license negotiation. Another helpful bit of documentation to have is some boilerplate language to stick into a license as needed. This goes along with the checklist in many ways. Say that your institution requires you to include accessibility language in all of your license agreements. You can have a standard clause ready to copy and paste into an agreement if you're presented with one without accessibility language. 
That way you're not starting from scratch each time. And ideally the publisher will just accept your, your clause without any changes. You could also manage the licensing workflow in your LSP. Sorry, make sure I'm on the right slide here in my... Okay, yes, thank you. Um, license negotiations can be very complex and take a long time to complete. Workflow management is an important component of this that will help you stay on task and stay organized throughout the process. There are many project management tools to choose from, but Duke's licensing team uses a Trello board to track license negotiations currently, licenses currently in negotiation. Basically, when we are presented with a new license to sign, we will add it to this board, which you see here, until we are able to assign it to a licensing team member. The team member then reviews, does a first review of the license and shepherds it through the process, negotiating with the publisher, all the while leaving helpful comments in Trello about how the negotiation is going so that other team members can see where, where the license is in the process. We can also see whether or not we are waiting to hear back from the vendor or if we need to follow up with them. We can see if we sent the license to our signatory and we're just waiting to receive a signed copy. We can also see previously signed licenses. Um, we could do a whole hour on <laughs> license workflow management in Trello specifically, but for now I've just shared the screenshot of what Duke's licensing Trello board looks like so that you can see, you know, just the different columns that we have and how we have the process organized, just as an example. Sorry, Devin, can you go back to the how to do it slide, please? I made it very complicated for this slide deck to just go back to the previous slide. Thank you. Um, another thing in workflow management is you can manage the licensing workflow in your LSP. And Yan will talk about ERM functionality for managing and storing licenses later, so I won't go into too much detail now. But a lot of what we use Trello for and what you saw on that board could be replaced with something like, you know, an Alma, Alma licensing workflow functionality. The last bit about workflow management that I think is is very important is, you know, just keeping track of versions of the files and file storage. In order to track changes to the license throughout the negotiation, you will either want to manually create new drafts of the document at each stage of the negotiation or rely on version control software and things like Box or Google Docs. Additionally, is it, it is important to make sure you're storing these drafts and final license documents in secure places with an understandable file naming convention so that you can easily refer back to something. I put an example on the slide of the general convention that we use at Duke to keep track of draft versions. We have the provider name, the license type, the draft number, the person who's negotiating, their, their initials, and the date of the draft. Lastly, remember to reach out for support when you need it. Talk to colleagues at other institutions if you aren't sure about certain language or if you need help coming up with new language to include in a license. Rely on consortia or other library networks for boilerplate language or assistance with negotiating. We are more effective when we work together. And in my experience, if I'm struggling with a certain licensing term, someone else is as well, and we end up helping each other. Sorry, Bev. I was so mesmerized. I forgot my turn. <laughs> so I'm back. Uh, and I'm going to start with more disclaimers. I have 20 minutes to talk to you about the meat and potatoes of the license itself. And this is something I usually spend several months on when I'm training new folks at NC State. Uh, so it's a lot to cram in. And most importantly, nothing I'm about to say is comprehensive, exhaustive, or in any particular order. I really cannot emphasize that enough. The other thing that I cannot emphasize enough is that you need to negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. When you get to this point, you will have talked to all your stakeholders, you'll have a solid idea of your institutional needs and wants, and you should just absolutely trust your gut. Just because a publisher gives you a license to sign doesn't mean you have to sign it as is. Now, of course, publishers are not out to get us. It's not a zero-sum game. 
but they're writing licenses from their own perspective. So, you know, our interests may align in a lot of places and that's great. Um, but if there are areas where our interests diverge, it is really okay to ask for edits. Say there's something in a license that's just impossible or unenforceable for your institution. It's completely fine to just explain your position and ask for that language to be removed or, you know, at least edited until it's mutually agreeable, which is the holy grail of licensing. Basically, you don't ask, you don't get. And I say that so much, I should just have t-shirts printed. Since we have limited time, I figured that the best way to approach this would be to talk about the license from the lens of some of the general sections that it may contain. And remember our motto here, not comprehensive, exhaustive, or in any particular order. Roughly, most clauses you encounter in a license are going to fall under one of these umbrellas that you see on this slide, and I'm just going to give you a little penny tour of each category. So if a formal definition section is not already present, there's no need to create one. But if you encounter a word or a phrase that's in title case, or it's otherwise like carved out in a really specific way, you do need to make sure that that word or phrase is clearly defined somewhere in the license. At minimum, you should define a few basic things like the parties to the agreement. Your library might be referred to as the customer, the licensee, participating institution, something else entirely. The entity that you're doing business with might be the publisher, the licensor, or whatever their company name is. And then there's the content that you're buying. That's going to have some kind of consistent shorthand in the license too, like publications, online products, licensed materials, so forth. Ultimately, it's really not important how the parties to the agreement and the license content are styled as long as it's consistent and clear. And now you absolutely need a clear definition of the type of users who are allowed to access the licensed content because licensors understandably frown on giving unauthorized users access to the content. So authorized users could be any combination of like faculty, staff, researchers, independent contractors, walk-in users, some other library patron class. Alumni can be authorized users, but just be aware that the licensor is probably going to impose additional fees to include them. Whoever you want to grant access to, just make sure that they are clearly included in the authorized user definition. Now, next in our slide deck, though not necessarily in the license, we have clauses that define the term of the contract and how it can be terminated. Here, term just means the duration of the license, and it can be anything that's mutually agreeable, annual being the most common. If you're licensing a product for more than a year, definitely consider a financial exigency clause, which you see an example of on this slide. It's likely already going to be an institutional requirement, and if it's not, it really should be. Basically, it's just saying that your institution can terminate the agreement with appropriate notice in the event of some severe budgetary shortfall. As to termination, it can just occur naturally when the term is over or both parties may have the option to terminate the license early under certain conditions. Both the licensee and the licensor have the right to terminate the license early due to a material breach. And this is an excellent example of why you need to make sure that your license, your institution's obligations in the license are reasonable. In general, just keep an eye out for anything that's leaving your institution vulnerable to some undesired outcome and just negotiate language to protect against that. Termination clause is a great example. If the licensor can terminate your contract due to some kind of breach, say you have a user whose credentials got compromised and Sci-Hub sucked up a whole bunch of content, make sure that you are given what is colloquially known as an opportunity to cure. Now that's normally a 30 day period where the breaching party has the opportunity to remedy the breach. And if they cannot, then the non-breaching party is given the right to terminate. The word may is really your friend here and absolutely everywhere in the license. In the clause that you see on the slide, the non-breaching party may terminate the agreement. It's not worded as something that's absolutely going to happen. In general, it's amazing how much more palatable a clause can become if you just replace will with may. Kind of a life lesson there too. <laughs> Uh, termination clauses can also outline other aspects of the post-termination world. These might be post-cancellation or perpetual access clauses, which we really don't have time to talk about, or they may be the licensor and licensee obligations to each other after the termination of the agreement. And normally these obligations are pretty benign, but we're seeing this disturbing rise in post-termination clauses that require the licensees to destroy all copies of the licensed content. Do not be afraid to just ruthlessly strike those. 
If the licensor won't go for it here, as in all things, make reasonable efforts is your friend. The language you see on the slide is a really great illustration of the power of make reasonable efforts. This clause is just wildly impossible and unenforceable without it. So we could literally do like an hours long workshop on authorized and unauthorized uses of the content. So I'm gonna do a really speedy review. Call me out in the Q and A if you feel like I'm unduly skimping on anything. Um, in a really brief license, this section may just be a couple of clauses, but most full licenses are going to devote a section or more to uses. These clauses may just be clustered together without any formalized header, but licensors consider them pretty vital, just like we do. So they're often going to call them out with headers like authorized uses or permitted uses, restrictions on use, unauthorized uses. They might cram all those concepts into a single header, which is really my personal favorite, like grant of access, permitted use, and limitations on use. Unless these convey a meaning that you don't want, the headers are not particularly important beyond just making the content more visually digestible. But what is contained in these clauses is absolutely pivotal because it's going to outline what your users can and cannot do with the content, which, as you know, really makes or breaks the value of the content. So if there's any use that's really important to you, just make sure that it's in here. Now, licenses are often going to restrict commercial uses of the content or anything else that a judge might view as causing market harm to the licensor, which is just negatively impacting their ability to sell their product. And that's perfectly reasonable. We should not be pushing back on that. What we should push back on is if the presence or absence of any clause imposes a burden on our institution or its users. So at bare minimum, you want to see authorized uses that include saving, copying, and printing portions of the content for personal, scholarly, or educational use. And uh, while it's a right that does not have to be licensed, it also never hurts to affirm that authorized users uh, can make a fair use of the licensed content. As Bethany mentioned, we love copy pasta. It is your friend. And I've included an example on the slide of a typical fair use clause that's in bullet number three. Um, in most cases, you should be able to lend the content by an interlibrary loan. And as long as they affirm the right to fulfill ILL requests in accordance with the U.S. Copyright Act and not CONTU, which is falling out of favor in library land, ILL clauses don't really have to be super detailed. Um, if the ILL clause references a particular product, just make sure it includes an out for changing software like the sample language shown on the slide here. Now, ideally, you'd also have the right to include the content in electronic reserves, course packs, upload it to learning management systems, or use it for text and data mining work. This is another thing we don't really have the time to go into, but just be aware that there are some special considerations for TDM licensing language, and it is a good idea to review this with your TDM subject matter expert, just you know, to make sure that the license does not unduly re restrict common processes like retaining temporary copies of the content for as long as is required for the project. So um, access, you know, obviously your licensor needs to know who your authorized user is and who's not, and they're going to expect you to accomplish this via authentication. Dominant flavor of the moment being IP authentication, but SAML-based services are really gaining a lot of steam. So I could talk about authentication for a half an hour easy and, you know, ask people, sadly, I have actually done that, uh, but we don't want our licenses to really be that detailed about it. As with ILL, these clauses should be tool agnostic. They need to give us the flexibility to explore new tools. So we want it to read something along the lines of, you know, customers access to publisher content shall be authorized via secure authentication and not customers access to publisher content shall be authorized via easy proxy. I mean, I love easy proxy, but that doesn't give us the flexibility that we need. Licensors are usually really understanding about this. Where they can occasionally exhibit a lack of understanding is when it comes to our ability to completely prevent unauthorized access. So you need to keep an eagle eye out for any parts of the license that require you to control or police user behavior. There's no such thing as 100% secure authentication or ensuring that authorized user credentials will never be put to an unauthorized use. Just ask every company that's ever gotten hacked and every user who's ever gotten locked out of their institutional account because their credentials were compromised and used for systematic downloading. I've included some compare and contrast language on the slide to illustrate this concept. <coughs> Pardon me. 
again, you know, these are just examples. You'll encounter a lot of flavors of these clauses in the wild, but as a general rule, you can agree to make reasonable efforts to inform users of terms and conditions. You can take reasonable measures to prevent unauthorized access, but you cannot ensure that users will abide by the terms or that there will be no cases of unauthorized access. <coughs> So um, responsibilities of the licensor and the licensee. So um, this is another area where these things might be called out in their own separate section. They might be peppered throughout the license. It might be a Venn diagram of both those things. It's a really wide net and it includes examples that I've already mentioned under the other categories in addition, but not limited to the following. The licensor might be obligated to make materials accessible either by default or upon request, uh, provide customer support, ample notice of downtime, usage statistics, maintain a certain amount of uptime or reimburse us if they don't. And reimbursed loss of access clauses are getting really scarce in the wild, but they are great on high value licenses if you can get them. Another little note about statistics, if the license limits usage statistics to internal use only, do not be afraid to ask what that means and push back if you do not like the definition, if it seems too inflexible. Now, the licensee, us, on the other hand, we might be obligated to implement and maintain a secure network, a credentials management system, uh, to make reasonable efforts, again, to notify patrons of terms and conditions, address cases of unauthorized use, tell the licensor if we become aware of unauthorized use, or just pay the license fee within a set period of time. As with all the areas of the license, you need to keep a really sharp eye on responsibilities, both yours and the licensors. Don't be afraid to edit or just completely strike any of these clauses that seem unreasonable or impossible to fulfill and to suggest clauses that you think a licensor should be fulfilling. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about liability clauses because there's usually just not a lot of wiggle room here. I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but it's difficult to get edits in this area. Uh, these are the screamy clauses, as I like to call them, because they're often in all caps and they are typically viewed as non-negotiable by the licensor, as you might imagine, since they scream at you about them. Uh, these terms are going to limit the licensor's liability for special, consequential, indirect, or some other kind of damages. While it's understandable to a certain extent that licensors don't want to be liable for anything they can't reasonably control, you should refuse to allow them to limit their liability for direct damages. It's kind of tricky to get your head around in an e-resources agreement, but direct damages are essentially just damages that are caused by an action or an inaction, and it's just not something that's reasonable to limit in this context. Few e-resources licensors are going to include direct damages in their limitation of liability at all, and none should balk about removing it if they do. Um, as with all license language, it's really important to understand your institution's position on the limitation of liability because many institutions will not accept this clause in licenses without some form of internal approval. And then there's warranties. So these are essentially promises that either or both parties make to each other. As the licensee, you should always make sure that the agreement is not compelling you to offer some kind of warranty that you cannot fulfill. As a general rule, it's just best to strike any licensee warranties other than those saying that the licensee has the power to enter into the agreement, like the one in the first bullet here. As long as your powers that be have not said anything to the contrary, something like that should be just fine. On the licensor's side, they should offer some kind of intellectual property warranty that stipulates that they actually have the power to enter in the agreement and grant the rights conferred, um, and that the you know they have the right to license the content without violating anyone else's intellectual property rights. This doesn't seem like a lot to ask for, but really, really important. The second bullet illustrates kind of a minimum standard for this type of clause, but they can be more detailed. Now, if you've got an intellectual property warranty, you want to make sure that claims of intellectual property infringement are not included in the limitation of liability statement. That could look something like the third bullet. Note the classic limitation of liability screaming here as a general rule, just match existing formatting when you're adding content, adding edits or making changes to it. So indemnities and warranties are usually coupled. The warranties are the promises and the indemnities are the penalties for breaking those promises. 
The indemnity clause usually states that should some special circumstance arise, one party is going to defend and pay the costs and expenses of the other. In library content licenses, this is typically going to be legal expenses, and it's usually going to be claims of intellectual property infringement. Occasionally, there'll be a clause indicating that the licensee will indemnify the licensor rather broadly for anything stemming from an unresolved breach of the agreement. Um, in, on this slide, you can see an example <coughs> excuse me, of this type of clause. And this is another area in which it is particularly important to understand your institution's tolerance levels. Many institutions are not going to accept a license that stipulates that the licensee will indemnify the licensor for anything at all, broad, narrow, anything in between. Typically, you would need to strike this clause uh, just outright. However, some institutions might allow it through uh, if the licensor is just really adamant about it and if the clause is edited to clarify any applicable restrictions like state contract laws. On the other hand, uh, most institutions are really happy for licensors to indemnify us. <laughs> we, we love that, uh, particularly in cases of intellectual property infringement, like the clause on this slide. So your institution might require something like this if the intellectual property warranty isn't as explicit as they would prefer. So let's take a little detour for a second that uh, for something that kind of seems like a side note, that seems like Tessa tangenting, but it's actually really important. If a license clause references some other clause, an appendix, a schedule, whatever, it's just referencing something else, just stop what you're doing right then and there and check that reference. Licenses can be convoluted beasts and we're all only human. It's really easy to accidentally introduce error into these references, particularly if you're in this epic negotiation where a lot of clauses are being struck and that's just going to alter the numbering of all the clauses after them. Now, most of the time, this is just an opportunity to check important details like IP addresses, title lists, pricing. Uh, but these references can also contain crucial information about your institution's obligations and the penalties for not meeting those obligations. So if you look at the first bullet on the slide here, this is a great example of this. If you don't comply with clause 10.2, your access might get suspended. So you need to read 10.2 and make sure it's something you really can't comply with. And then there is the big bucket O general clauses. Now, sometimes these are at the beginning of the contract, but usually they're at the end. It's just a mixed bag of provisions. Some of them can seem relatively benign, like the first two bullets on the slide, but they actually really pack a big punch. So the entire agreement clause means that only the only terms that govern are the ones in this actual contract. So if you reach some understanding with the license or over email, but you didn't codify that understanding in the license, you're just out of luck here. And the second bullet actually uh, prevents the licensor from being able to alter the contract without your signed written approval, so say by changing their online terms and conditions. Confidentiality clauses might be lumped in with the general terms carved out into their own section or kind of woven in somewhere else. Wherever they are, you should never agree to keep confidential on pricing or the terms and conditions of the license. If you're at a private institution, your administration might have a policy preventing you from agreeing to this kind of clause. If you work for a state institution, your state's public records clauses are likely going to make it illegal for you to agree to this kind of clause. So this is really vital. I'm a little too tight on time to go into them, but there are so many other provisions that fall into this section. Um, governing law, force majeure, these highly specific clauses that are required by your state or your institution. The audits clause in North Carolina is an example of that. That's North Carolina contract law. So you can see why it is so important to do all that research and documentation that Bethany just walked you through. And why it's so important to revisit all this work on a somewhat regular basis, since institutional priorities and, you know, just the licensing landscape can shift a lot over time. Two great examples of this would be the license language surrounding accessibility and artificial intelligence. So licensing for content accessibility is actually congealing really nicely. It took a while, but we're totally getting there. And in particular, the TRLN guide for negotiating accessibility in e-resource licenses is a really great resource on this subject. It's going to be in our resource slide at the end. Now, on the other hand, artificial intelligence licensing language, that's still really wild west right now. There's a couple of big content providers that are including this language in their licenses, and it completely restricts the use of artificial intelligence tools. Might look a little bit like the bullet on this slide under artificial intelligence here. 
Um, but meanwhile, there's a lot of folks in the library licensing community that are coming out and saying that this is just wild overreach. So kind of stay tuned in this area. So to sum it up, it's pretty clear that license negotiation and the documentation that it generates is very complex, very challenging to stay on top of, but you can totally do it. We believe in you. And on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Yan to bring us home with a discussion of the ins and outs of managing licenses and the metadata that they generate. Thanks, Tessa. I love all the examples you gave. Um, so... Okay, while I'm talking, I'm going to turn off my camera to save internet bandwidth. Here we go. All right, so our last topic of this webinar will focus on managing licenses. Why do we even need to manage license? First of all, as I mentioned earlier, license improvements, they are legal contracts that delineate how license materials can be used Managing licenses is crucial for legal compliance and risk mitigation, ensuring adherence to terms, conditions, and avoiding potential legal disputes or penalties for unauthorized use. Secondly, keeping licenses organized provide convenient access when never needed. Regarding what to manage, it can be many types of documents. A license agreement is the contract where Publishers and your institution or library both sign on. Amendments, addendums, and schedules are supplementary documents, which often specify additional titles covered by licenses or modify certain terms for specific resources. Other supplemental documents, such as invoices, orders, email correspondence, title list, and maybe other local documentation, they offer crucial uh, additional information that should be returned. Here are some strategies for managing licenses. Um, I think a couple of them already been mentioned earlier by Bethany and then I see a, a few chats came up also uh, touched on a few of the strategies here. Um, so first of all, having a centralized repository or system ensures all documents are stored in one accessible location. This eliminates the needs to search multiple sources and make it easy to find the needed documents. And then organize the document in a structured way. This entails creating logical folder structures, such as by publisher names and renewal year. Some libraries like Duke have a separate workspace for licenses in progress and completed. And then a consistent naming convention. This is the one I think uh, there, were, there was a chat mentioned to give a great example for this one name convention. Uh, helps organize documents in a logical and a systematic way. It provides a standard format where staff can quickly identify the content and the context just, just by looking at the file names. And the last one is version control. I believe that Bethany also touched this a little bit earlier. A license negotiation may take several rounds and it can last for months or a year. Maintaining version control helps track changes, updates, and revisions. It ensures easy access to the most recent versions and past versions if needed. To achieve this, you may add dates to the file name or append like revision numbers to it. License agreements and supporting documents are stored differently across institutions and libraries, influenced by local practices and legal obligations. Some organizations keep physical copies for archival backup or audit reasons. Internal network like network drive and intranet enable sharing collaboration among colleagues. Electronic resource management systems, which we'll be seeing a few examples later, are software solutions used for managing electronic resources in libraries. There is a growing preference for digital storage due to its efficiency, accessibility, and security advantages. However, it is essential for organizations to select the method that best suits their uh, specific requirements taking into account local legal and regulatory obligations regarding record retention and storage. A ERM system provides extensive functionalities for managing life cycle, the life cycle of electronic resources. It acts as a centralized storage for agreements in a supporting document. 
It streamlines renewals and cancellations through tracking the start and end dates, often accompanied by alert features. The system enables the reporting, mapping, and the management of specific license terms and clauses crucial for library services, such as interlibrary loan and perpetual right, and also all other clauses terms that Tessa mentioned in her part of the presentation. Usage tracking facilitates the data informed decision making for library staff. Some ERM systems offer workflow support for task assignment and a real time progress monitoring. Beyond mere storage, an ERM system serves as a pivotal hub, linking all important information to support e resource management effectively. ERF system come in various options. Some, like NC State's uh, eMetrics, are developed in-house, offering high levels of customization by demanding development resources. Others, like Folio and Coral, are open source, supported by a community, and are similarly customizable, but also requiring development inputs. Additionally, commercial products like Alma are available on the market, offering polished solutions without the need for local development work. Libraries can select the option that best suits their requirements. Over the next few slides, we will briefly look at a few ERM examples. Uh, eMetrix is uh, uh, a homegrown ERM at NC State University Libraries offers comprehensive functionality across various areas, such as licensing access, collection evaluation, reporting, and name authority. The image licensing module centralizes all electronic resources license agreements for the NC State University libraries. Through a mapping process, it simplifies uh, licenses into key components for easier interpretation by staff. It highlights important areas like permitted use and restrictions. Each map the license includes a link to the original PDF document. The photo ERM, which is used by Duke now, but soon to be replaced by AMA, uh, contains several e resource applications, including the license app, which stores extensive license information with customizable terms, related organizations, and links to license files and relevant documents. Folio's customization flexibility allows institutions to emphasize pertinent information. At Duke, um, customized terms expedite common queries regarding like user restrictions, uh, interlibrary loan availability, and the cancellation details. The agreement app serves as a hub linking licenses with other e resource apps. Duke did not implement um, the agreement app, though, because they faced uh, integration challenges with the app due to a limited knowledge-based integration with Folio for connecting e resource holding at the time. Coral, another open source ERM, um, consists of five interoperable modules. The licensing module offers storage and access for digital copies of the current and expired license uh, agreements and related documents. It allows institutions to customize track terms and document types through the administrative interface. Features include parent-child relationship between agreements and amendments, signature tracking, organization and consortium association, attachment uploads, and a license term to add on to retrieve resource holdings uh, and governing license terms, a feature often used to support interlibrary loan. The, the last example we want to touch on is AMA. I see a chat, someone, some other libraries using AMA. Um, so uh, the license management module allows the libraries to include both standard and custom defined fields in license records. Staff can customize the user interface to display relevant terms only. Alma facilitates the creation of detailed license records and addition of addendum or amendments. As shown in the screenshot here, the license details in Alma is comprised of several tabs. Summary, which includes information such as status, start, and and dates of the license, license terms, which provide information about terms used, restriction, and property right, etc. And the inventory, which lists active and historical resources governed by the license. PO lines are purchase orders linked to the license, um, and the amendment, administration history notes, and attachment.
All right, to conclude this section, uh, here is a summary of best practices for managing licenses, establishing a centralized document repository, implementing consistent filing and naming conventions, and regularly updating and reviewing document metadata. All right, uh, for the interest of time, we won't delve deeply into all the details or topics that we covered today. Uh, we have put together some resources for you. Some of them are more URM focused and others more broadly related materials for licensing. We hope that you'll find them helpful. There's one more page for resources. Before we end our presentation, we'd like to extend our gratitude to Beverly Charlotte from NC Central and Abby Wicks from Duke for their valuable feedback on this presentation. And thank you to all the attendees for your time and attention. We are open for questions now. Now, if you have questions, feel free to type them in chat. Thank you so much, Ian, Tessa, Bethany. Folks, if you have any questions, feel free to add them into chat. We wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for this. Yeah, and if you have your hand raised, um, would you, so Anjana, would you prefer to unmute yourself or send in a chat? No, I am actually unmuted. Perfect. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I work with Alma and uh, <clears throat> we are entering the license terms right from the agreement to the Alma. And we have several license terms in there that are pre-populated by Alma. So basically, it just gives you the license terms, and then you can choose to add the disc description or the particular license terms in Alma within the field. Uh, what we have noticed, you know, that there are some of the terms that are missing in the sense that we at this time do not have anything to record the read and publishing agreements. That's one thing. So, you know, we can add, uh, the, if you have the uh, proper permissions, you can also add the licensing uh, terms type categories and all that stuff. So I haven't yet experimented with that, but uh, um, one thing I have seen is that when you are adding the terms in the license um, category for each field, you know, you are given a particular box where you can put in the terms. So I am, uh, I mean, like we are converting the license in Word document and then we are, you know, cutting and pasting from there because my understanding and I think I'm of the opinion that I should not interpret the legal terms. I should just put them as it is. Uh, one thing that we have seen, you know, that while converting these PDF copies and all that, it is such a laborious process, you know. And uh, so I all wanted to know that whoever is working with Alma license agreement, have you discovered any easier way of uh, adding those legal terms in Alma or uh, do you just not uh, add the terms like you know detailed terms because Alma allows you to you know choose yes or no and different type of things like suppose it is terms related to ILL you can choose permitted prohibited and whatnot and I like to put in exactly what is prohibited too. So I sim simply just cut and paste, but sometimes, you know, it becomes very difficult. So I was just wondering, you know, if anybody has any opinion about it or has found a workaround around that. I can speak on that a little bit. I used to work at an, an Alma institution and Duke will be moving to Alma in the summer, which we're very excited about. Um, but in terms of coding, all the terms in a license in Alma, we just decided to focus on a few terms that were most important to us and just made sure that we were consistent and faithfully recording, you know, the text of the PDF in those for those specific terms rather than filling out all the different options mm -hmm. um, in Alma. Um, and we'd also have to like, you know, when, when you sign the, the the executed version of the the license, it's usually a PDF. So we'd have to go back and like yeah. convert it to a Word document to make sure we could actually get, you know, copy. So the formatting wouldn't be weird. So it is a very time 
consuming process. Yeah. So I'd be, I'd be curious to hear from anyone here who, if you found like a different, better, more time effective way to do it. But yeah, I would say just focusing on key clauses that are important to you and your institution. I just want to add something here. Uh, at our institution also, we feel that, uh, and we think, and I think we agree also, that we have, I mean, the ILL terms and the copyright terms and authorized users, these are the only terms that actually, you know, are uh, probably worth displaying in your Primo discovery search. Because if you display everything, then your search results become like a huge list and nobody's interested in reading those terms. So basically, we decided that we'll work with ILL terms only and authorized users and, you know, sometime even cancellation and all that just to keep us on track. Um, but I, you know, like, I I want to be exhaustive. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm like, I'm at this point, I'm working on it. And uh, I mean, why don't I just put in everything that is possible there? And we haven't yet kind of made a uh, decision about displaying the terms um, in Primo Discovery, but I agree with you that uh, it is a good idea to decide which terms are important for you. And other than ILL and copyright terms, I think readers are not, I mean, like your library patrons are not interested in anything else other than knowing the copyright and ILL term. And as you said very well, that main agreement is always there. So, <laughs> I mean, like, I've tried to be exhaustive, uh, but, you know, like, I'm working with somebody who is very diligent and she's also like while we are here let us put everything in there so that's the thing but you know like this copying and pasting sometimes it really gets on our nerves but that's okay yeah okay. so um uh, this is may not be this is not in elma but i know that some open source like a coral they do have a onyx po kind of a anon too you can import onyx po uh onyx pl type of license terms um, I'm wondering, I mean, on my community, like, there's so many institutions that we're using now. So if there's anything, you know, the their development team can think about, you know, put on their development agenda, think about do, developing such tool, like import certain terms into their uh, license module. Um, so just a thought here. Yeah, and this is probably, because uh, I see we're a little close to time, speaking of Coral, this is probably a good time to seg into um, support for implementation. I see we have a question in the chat from Gwen about how much support was required for implementation of Coral, and Yan is our, our resident Coral authority. Yan, can you comment on that? Oh, uh, thanks for uh, bringing that up, Tessa. Um, development resource for Coral. Coral is, um, because it's open source, there's a community behind uh, that uh, work on development. But I think the community right now is trying to get as much help from the community as far as development resources. Um, so for local library, right, if you have an IT person that you can work with, help you uh, install a local instance of Coral, that's great, right? But if you don't have any IT person uh, staff on board, you could work with some hosting company. There's a couple of companies who provide a hosting service uh, that help you set up a Coral. Um, and then, of course, if you have any needs for uh, enhancement requests, things like that, you want to make changes, customization, those are need to be brought up to the Coral community for their consideration. So there's like a team, they can prioritize all the requests, you know, making changes. Um, uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Well, it, it does somewhat. So thanks very much. I, were you just speaking about Alma though? Are you, did you go from Coral to Alma or are you all? Well, Alma? they're sort of different things. You know, Coral okay. is really just an electronic resources management system. Uh, it's not a full, uh, you know, library management system like Alma. Right. Alma has some ERM functionality, and that's what Anjana was just talking about is the licensing subcomponent okay. of that. But Coral is going to be just you know, the ERM. It's piece. just the ERM stuff. So like managing licenses, resources, contacts, that kind of thing. Yeah. I will say that at NC State, uh, we had a staff member who's not dedicated to supporting Coral, but spent an awful lot of time doing it. So it's a great uh, tool, but if you don't have somebody on staff who's got programming chops, it's it's kind of challenging yeah. to implement and maintain. Yan, would you say that's a fair statement? 
you got to have somebody on staff that's that's good, decent programmer with some server side skills. Yeah, yeah I, I would say probably, yeah, because as it's open source, right? Oftentimes, there, if they make changes to software that require a local IT person to help upgrade your own uh, instance locally, making sure it's a keep it consistent with whatever out there. Um, so, yeah. But, you yeah. know, yeah. yeah. Hosting well, thank, services, thank third party is another option. Yeah. Yeah, no, we've looked at it a little bit and I really like the way it looks and I love the, I, I've actually referred to it as like this grand Rolodex of just organizing all this. Because, yeah, we're spreadsheets and network drives and please rein this in at a, at a low cost. But, it's free like kittens and we don't have mm -hmm. that it support mm -hmm. um so anyway so thank you for sharing that um can i just go I... back one minute to that uh mention about onyx pl <clears throat> in alma uh you know in alma we do have uh, a button for onyx pl and my understanding about onyx pl is that it is a protocol which is a standard thing you know like uh it's a license agreement that comes in a particular, like all the terms are already mentioned in there. But the thing is, what I understand is that the publisher should give you the license agreement in Onyx PL format for you to be able to upload it in Alma. And that is a dream world. Because if it was like that, if every publisher followed that Onyx PL standard, I think we will have to do nothing. Like you just upload the Alma Onyx PL and it would work but i have some discussion with uh, somebody who is at the niso standards and they kind of told me that onyx pl is almost dead because nobody wants to work with it because it's so much work and publishers just don't want to work with it because they have to kind of you know change their policies and everything so i just was curious to know that do you have any information about the current status of onyx pl or if you are working with it and if you're working, how? Like, are publishers giving you a license agreement in non XPL format? Yeah, so this is the big challenge. <laughs> publishers didn't universally adopt it. Um, I have never pursued it. So I can't, you know, honestly say, oh, you know, nobody will give you an non XPL license because we have eMatrix at NC State and we've had it for a really long time. So we've got it working really well. We do. It's extensive manual coding, but once it's done, it maintains itself pretty well. Um, I don't have high hopes that everybody's going to adopt on XPL, but Yan, you were about to say something. I was going to say similar, you know, uh, <laughs> I know in Coral community, um, there might be some libraries who is using <clears throat> on XPL uh, import tools. If you want to learn more, you know, you can go to the Coral website, see if you can find any information. Um, but I guess, you know, maybe think about may not be on XPL, you know, if you have very strong IT staff on board, right, and be friendly with them, talk to them, hey, can you develop a tool for us to do this integration <laughs> with Alma, right, Bethany, you know, maybe that's something we can do. <laughs> <laughs> like Tessa said, if you don't ask, you won't get, so. Yeah. <laughs> And when this Onyx PL thingy came up, you know, I was so excited that, my God, I mean, we used to have serial solution at that time. And I was like, wow, this is going to work so good. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and <laughs> it's just not happening. So that's why I was curious. Thank you very much, everybody. I, I think, I, can I just jump in? I think it's a great question and a great conversation. And I, I'm still kind of new to this whole world navigating it. Um, but I love at least that there's some standards in the world that I'm trying to get my head around, which is all the usage statistics. So is there a possibility that the folks who are reigning in the counter stuff might pull this into their, uh, you know, scope of things, the, the Onyx, if, I mean, I just, thank you for putting these links in here. I had, I didn't even know what you were saying Onyx PL, but basically trying to standardize a mess <laughs> and counter, I, I I mean, it's still so much I'm trying to figure out, but it's a mess and somebody's trying to standardize it and they seem to be moving forward. Does anyone know enough about what's going on with counter to know if maybe they could take that out, take that into their- It's NISO, I think, that's, did NISO take on counter 
or they've always had it. NISO is great for standards organization, but you know they have a very lean staff. So okay. I'm a plug for them. If anybody wants to volunteer for a NISO committee, <laughs> I'm sure they'd be really happy to have you because most of those working groups are volunteers. Wow. Saru, for example, which Bethany mentioned during her um, portion of the talk, shared electronic resources understanding. My predecessor, Selden Lamro, was really integral in getting that put together and I think was maybe a co-chair for that committee. So there's always great opportunities to do this kind of standards work. Unfortunately, with Onyx PL, you really got to get publishers to pick up on it too, because ultimately they're the ones that need to give you the XML that is the, the license. And this is where negotiation might work against us just a little bit, because you know if we negotiate certain things out of a license, then Onyx PL, when we get that file, it's not necessarily correct. So let's say a publisher has a confidentiality clause, they give you an Onyx PL file with a confidentiality clause in it, but you managed to get them to strike that. So then you're still there's still gonna be some manual work involved yeah. with this. If you're getting kind of a more bespoke license, you do kind of have to sit and look at it and map the terms and really understand what your license is because NC State's license for something is gonna be different from Duke's. And this is a good seg for another question that we had in the chat. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm blanking on the name. There's so many people talking. I think it was Lauren who was asking if anybody had any um, information about uh, artificial intelligence clauses because they just got a license from IEEE that the AI clause is a page long, which I just, I don't know how you can say a page of stuff about artificial intelligence, but um, NC State just signed a license with IEEE a year or so ago, and they weren't doing that clause. So the Onyx PL is going to be different for State and um, Lawrence Institution. So that that kind of gives you an illustration of where, yeah, Onyx PL would be awesome, and I really wish publishers had picked up on it more, but it does represent a lot of work for them. You know, it's kind of high touch there's really no way to automate this kind of stuff right now. Maybe artificial intelligence will do it for us. <laughs> so does anybody have any anything that they can unmute and talk about or put into the chat about experience with artificial intelligence clauses? Because they're really just hitting licenses right now. And basically, a lot of them are impossible to fulfill um, because they say, you can't use any AI tools. And a lot of publishers are also developing tools that use artificial intelligence to help users interact with the content. So it's like a built-in breach almost. I think publishers are just scared and they're trying to get something in fast and they're not necessarily considering the, the ramifications. Does anybody have any comments or thoughts on that? I have just a small comment about Gwen's question about usage data and how she's managing and all that. I just wanted to say that, you know, um, Sushi protocol can help you if you can set up the Sushi protocol to get your stats that will push your uh, stats, you know, every whatever interval you set it for. And that will help you as a level. But otherwise, <laughs> the, AI clauses also might be something that eventually later this year we'll be able to circle back to with a webinar mm -hmm. of some kind. Um, because it, yeah, like you said, Tessa, it is the wild, wild west right now. And there's not a clear path or direction that things seem to be going in. Yeah. And it's, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak ill. Uh, you know, we're all friends with publishers, you know, we, some, some of our best friends are publishers, but they're being, at least in my experience, they're being a little inflexible about artificial intelligence right now. And I understand where they're coming from. Um, it could be very threatening to their business model, but when you have software companies that are developing tools that use AI, you cannot forbid the use of AI with your products because you're basically just creating a condition where all of your customers are suddenly going to be in material breach of their licenses just because somebody's used a citation manager tool or something. You know, it's very complicated. Bethany has put a link into chat. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I thought it was. There's an Authors Alliance blog post that's kind of talking about this topic. There's also been discussion on LibLicense. I don't say live license, but I guess maybe I should. <laughs> I no, please don't. I've heard some people say live license and it just sounds... <laughs> 
I mean, I get to it. Me. I get it. It's like lib guides. Library license. Lic yeah. Yeah. But I can't do it. No. Uh, but there's been discussion on lib license about AI clauses. Um, it's something that we're all going to be talking about at our institutions. Uh, but we just need to, because as licensed negotiators, we don't make these policies. We merely enforce them. So my administration, both libraries and possibly even university level, needs to tell me how they feel about artificial intelligence clauses because I don't have the authority to make that policy. <laughs> yep. Ooh, webinar about fair use and TDM and AI. Ah, oh, nice. Thank you, Bethany. I mm. actually haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I've had the recording sitting in my inbox, so I wanted to share it. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all. Any other questions before we wrap up? A B H A T T. Page out. <laughs> oh, All right. Um, well, presenters, yeah. thank you so much for your time and sharing your extensive knowledge. Uh, folks, uh, somebody just asked in the chat, um, tomorrow morning you will receive an email including the recording for today's session, um, these slides. I'll also add in a copy of the chat transcript with all the links. Um, and then a feedback survey. So please let me know in that survey what you liked, what you'd like us to offer more of, um, if there are further e-resources management licensing topics that you want us to cover, let me know. Um, I'm so glad this fantastic dream team of presenters was able to make time this afternoon. Um, it's been really enlightening on my end as well and learning from you all. So thanks so much. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.